I've been making these videos for 5 years and I still haven't learned how to prepare these things with time. On the contrary, it seems that every year I end up doing them later and later. And if I continue like this, the top 10 of 2021 will probably come out during the summer of 2022? But hey, leaving aside the fact that we are already in March, I think it is worth jumping into another recount of the video games that made me fall in love. So, for the first time ever, I welcome you to Medusa's Top 10 Games of 2020, English Edition. While there were quite a few disappointments throughout the year, there were also many surprises. So many that I had to once again include a list of honorable mentions for those games I think deserve to be recognized, but did not make it into the top 10. It is important to mention that this list is extremely personal and therefore subjective. I am not trying to rate the games by objective and technical qualities. Instead, I rely exclusively on my personal enjoyment, so you will most likely see absence or nominations that you will disagree with. Also, I must remind you that the list is made exclusively of games available on the PC. Console exclusives have not been included, simply because I don't have any. Similarly, the top 10 will not include remasters, DLCs, early access or re-releases of games from previous years. This in order to give more space to new titles. And well, with nothing more to add, we can start with this top 10. Honorable Mentions Sky, developed by Decoded Productions Probably the most minimalist game that has made it into my top 10. This is a small independent project developed by a group of students from the Breda University of Applied Science as an end of course test, and if it were up to me, I would give them a 10. Sky puts you in command of a small plane to explore an island of the coast of Europe at your leisure. During your journey you meet the inhabitants of this region, who will ask for help with some of the problems they have, or will simply share their life stories. On the island you can also find some challenges, such as hidden collectibles and races against the clock. It is not the most complex game in the world, however, it has a lot of heart, the artistic design is very good, the fly mechanics are entertaining, and it fulfills its objective of offering the player a relaxing and calm experience, in addition to having the enormous plus of being free. If you're looking to spend a nice rainy afternoon, Sky is the game for you. Command and Conquer Remastered Collection Developed by Petroglyph Games and Lemon Sky Studios. Ok, I'm going to shit a bit. I know I said the remasters weren't allowed on my top 10, but I really want to give the folks at Petroglyph and Lemon Sky some big kudos for bringing this flagship of strategy games back to life. Remastering Tiberian Dawn and Red Alert was nothing easy. The developers literally had to do digital archaeology in order to modernize the programming and make it compatible with modern systems, while still respecting the classic elements of the game. And their excellent work is reflected in the quality of the product. The unit looks amazing in high definition, the cinematics show details that were impossible to notice in the original game, and the remastered music of Frank Klepaki is incredible. Command and Conquer was a huge part of my childhood, and seeing these games receive this level of respect certainly deserves to be recognized. Of course, in terms of gameplay, they are still the sons of a bitch they were in the 90s, with their terrible cheating artificial intelligence, their unbalanced maps, and their overpowered units, and I wouldn't want it any other way. That's the Command and Conquer that I remember and love. Resident Evil 3 Remake, developed by Capcom. The case of this remake is quite curious. In my opinion, the biggest problem with the game is that it came out too early, less than a year after the huge success of the Resident Evil 2 Remake, which left it in a rather unfavorable position when the inevitable comparisons came. RE3 is way shorter, and does not innovate enough to escape the shadow of its prequel, it also scraped several emblematic things of the original game, such as the clock tower, the alternative paths and endings, or the mercenaries game mode. 
But despite all this, I am not lying when I say that the short hours I spent playing this remake were extremely fun. I really had a blast exploring the streets of Raccoon City, running away from Nemesis and blowing the heads off some zombies. The RE engine continues to showcase its enormous abilities to create incredible settings. The redesign of classic enemies like Hunters is absolutely terrifying, and the excellent voice acting brings to life several of my favorite characters. However, I agree with much of the criticism that exists against it. In my opinion, this game in its current state looks more like a DLC than a proper sequel, and I recommend that if you are interested in buying it, wait for a discount of 50% or more, as I do not think it's worthwhile with its current price. It's a shame, because I really think that if it had an extra year in the oven, Resident Evil 3 Remake could have been a classic, but hey, no point crying over spilled milk, so it will have to settle with an honorable mention. Monster Prom 2, Monster Camp, developed by Beautiful Glitch. I never thought a dating scene would be one of my favorite games of the year, but Monster Prom certainly deserves it. This is not the typical visual novel that everyone knows, rather it is a game with some of the best and most varied dialogue that I have seen in a long time, full of reference and jokes that really resonated with my terrible sense of humor. Each of the six main singles is unique, offering different playstyles depending on who you want to fall in love with during the game, and even the secondary characters have their own characteristics and curious narrative arcs. There are a lot of unique events which ensure that you can replay multiple times without running into anything that you have already seen before, and each of these events can be resolved in different ways depending on the stats of your character. And if that was not enough, the multiplayer mode is great, as you and your friends can try to help each other win your respective singles, or better yet, ruin their lives by interfering with their pathetic attempts to find love. Monster Prom 2 Monster Camp surpasses all aspects of the first game, more options, more dialogue, more adventures, more loves and hates, and that's why it deserves an honorable mention in the top 10. Number 10 Total War Saga, Troy, developed by the Creative Assembly. Come, friend, you too must die. Why moan about it? The new installment of Total War brings us one of the most interesting and fun representations of the Trojan War in any medium. First of all, I must let you know that I am not an expert in this franchise, my experience is simply limited to Warhammer, and I am so bad that playing on normal difficulty is a huge challenge for me. Despite this, I love Total War, and it certainly has become my favorite strategy game franchise in recent years. Troy has very marked difference in gameplay to Warhammer, while the latter is more focused on combat and conquest, the former focuses on diplomatic relations with neighboring nations. The amount of resources you can obtain is quite limited, especially food, which makes it impossible to maintain multiple large armies, forcing you either to create defensive alliances with your neighbors so that their armies keep your borders secure, or to create trade agreements with multiple friendly nations to increase your income. These diplomatic maneuvers will lead the world to separate into two very clear camps, the Greek nations and the Trojans with their allies. But unlike the Iliad, the outcome of the war is now in your hands, because you can choose the side you want and lead it to victory. The game has a more realistic approach to the war. While you can pray to the gods for help, they never show up to support you directly, instead they simply give small benefits to the morale of your population and armies. Meanwhile, the mythological creatures like minotaurs, cyclops or centaurs are presented in the game as normal people who use their physical appearance and costumes to intimidate enemies. Troy offers a good variety of factions based on Homer's poem. All of them have unique units and mechanics, however it should be noted that unlike Warhammer, the factions are way more similar, sharing many of their basic combat units and infrastructure. The combat remains strategic and brutal. 
The lack of artillery or typical cavalry makes unit positioning more important than ever. On many occasions I managed to grasp impossible victories with a small garrison against far superior numbers of enemies, by simply forcing them to fight in bottlenecks where their numbers come for nothing. The units are beautifully animated and their movements are precise, with a pathfinding that although not perfect, compensates for its flaws by offering a great deal of direct control regarding the positioning of your forces, which is extremely necessary during the enormous battles that you will constantly have. Commander upgrades are also enormously important, not only for the diplomatic and economic benefits they offer, but also the huge bonus to your army strength and morale. Two enemy commanders meeting on the battlefield is undoubtedly one of the most epic moments that this total war can offer, as the rest of the troops immediately open the way for them to have an incredible duel in the purest Hollywood style, and whoever wins will give a brutal blow to the morale of the enemy army. Regrettably, the game isn't without flaws, and Troy shares some classic problems that have already been seen before on this franchise. Regardless of which faction you use, the start of the campaign is extremely slow, and you have to skip several turns while obtaining resources, establishing a basic infrastructure and building your army. Later, during mid and end game, your own allies bombard you with ridiculous trade agreements that do not offer anything of value, so you constantly have to waste time rejecting their requests. The AI has some problems that allow you to easily exploit its behavior, and some unit compositions are practically indestructible. However, these complaints are very small compared to the amount of fun that this game gave me. It took me a while, but once I got hooked, Total War Saga Troy became an extremely addictive experience, and I could not leave until the campaign was complete. It is not Total War Warhammer 3. However, it is an excellent appetizer while we wait for the main course, and the fun it offered me gives it a place in my top 10 of 2020. Number 9 Gears Tactics, developed by Splash Games and The Coalition Since the release of XCOM Enemy Unknown in 2012, the turn-based tactics genre has had a small resurgence. Xenonauts, Mutant Year Zero, Phoenix Point, Battletech, Mechanicus, even Mario has its own game in the genre. So it wasn't surprising when it was announced at the E3 of 2018 that Gears of War would jump into this pool. The only question was how well would Gears third person shooter action fit into turn based gameplay? And the answer is that it fits very well. The work that the developers did to translate the speed and violence of Gears Combat to a much slower and systematic gameplay is striking. This is accomplished by rewarding an adventurous combat style where you are willing to take risks and be aggressive during your turns. The battle system is quite typical within the genre. You can move your units, use their skill and attack enemies, which will spend action points. Once you run out of action points, the locus will take their turn. What sets Gears apart from other tactics games is its action point recovery and execution system. Unless they receive critical damage, units do not die immediately, but remain incapacitated, and can be revived by its allies, but they are also susceptible to being executed. If you immediately execute an incapacitated enemy, all your units gain an extra action point that allows you to continue fighting, which in turn you can take advantage of and incapacitate and execute more enemy units, which will give you more action points. So with a little planning and a bit of good luck, it is possible to decimate entire squads in a single turn. I think this system allows for amazing gameplay, as it rewards you for constantly staying on the offensive, flanking and pushing as much as possible. To aid you in your goal of annihilating the Locus, Gears offers you 5 different classes of troops, Support, Vanguard, Sniper, Heavy and Scouts, each with unique types of equipment and specialities. As they participate in missions, your soldiers gain experience and level up, allowing you to pick new skills to specialize them in specific branches. For example, your support units can become combat medics or they can offer buff and give extra action points to your allies, while scouts can specialize in stealth and set traps for enemies or in being close-range killing machines. 
and the best part is that you can combine elements of these specialities to establish your own playstyle. Unfortunately, the locusts are not going to sit still and let you shoot them in the face. They also have a great variety of units, snipers that force you to maintain cover, tickers that run towards you and explode, commanders that give buffs to their allies and stay away from the front line, etc. All of them use their own skills and tactics to ruin your plans, and you will constantly have to adapt your strategy to be able to take back the initiative. But without a doubt, the most outstanding enemies are the bosses, which immediately became one of my favorite aspects of the game, as you fight against immense war beasts in epic and explosive battles that require all of your concentration and skill to be able to win. Another salient point is the graphic fidelity. Although this is not an aspect that I usually highlight, the truth is that Gears Tactics' use of the Unreal Engine is impressive, being by far the best looking game in this genre. The environments fit perfectly within the artistic design of the franchise and are full of small details that make them feel like real locations and not just like levels in a game. The story is simple but entertaining, linking some details from the original Gears of War trilogy with the new installments. The main characters likewise follow the same basic stereotypes that have already been seen in this franchise, however their voice acting is quite good and it gives them a bit more personality. The last point I want to talk about is the game accessibility. The tactical turn-based genre is quite complicated, especially for new players, so Gears Tactics tries to simplify things for them, offering a wide variety of choices of difficulty, giving constant advice to help you improve and offering a lot of information so that at all times you know the possible advantage and consequences of the actions you are going to take. However, this also makes me have a couple of very personal criticisms. First is that Gears Tactics does not have a base construction and management system, which is one of my favorite mechanics within this genre of video games. It also lacks a research and upgrade system for your equipment, instead you have loot boxes, which can be obtained by completing side objectives in each mission or by recovering them during the levels. Each box gives you a random upgrade for a particular weapon type or a new piece of armor. Likewise, the recruitment system has been extremely simplified. In games like XCOM, your troops are so valuable that you end up becoming attached to them, and therefore it hurts more when they die. But in years outside of the main characters, the recruits always felt expendable, especially since you are constantly getting new troops which are normally higher level than the troops you have been developing throughout the game, so losing one in combat does not feel as painful. Finally, my biggest complaint is the side missions, which although they are entertaining when you first encounter them, offering variety in the gameplay, by the last act of the story they became repetitive and cumbersome. They feel like a way to extend the campaign beyond what was necessary, and act like an obstacle before you can continue playing the main missions, which in comparison are more fun. But despite these complaints I have, Gears Tactics is by far one of my favorite experiences of the year. The feeling of being surrounded by enemies in an impossible situation only to start chaining critical shots and execution to snatch a victory out of the jaws of defeat is unmatched, and I feel that if the developers decide to make a sequel with a few improvements to its mechanics, they could easily take the crown from XCOM as the best game in this genre. Number 8 Carrion developed by Phobia Game Studio. In the darkest and deepest corners of the air, something has awakened. Something inhuman, wild, intelligent, something hungry. Carrion is the commercial debut of the small Polish developer Phobia Game Studio, and I think they have hit a home run. The game describes itself as reverse horror, because instead of being a survivor trying to escape from a creature, you are the... What the hell was that? Hello? Someone... We are the creature. From the very first moment, Cavern put us in control of a small sample of a colony of carnivorous worms, which we will help escape through multiple secret facilities. To ship this, the colony must become stronger and larger, assimilating all the pathetic human biomass that crosses our path. Stupidly, they will try to resist the inevitable, 
energy shields, motion detectors, liquid explosives, flamethrowers, and more. The human biomass will make use of all their pathetic inventions to harm us. A biomass sack by itself is not a threat to the colony. However, when they are armed with these tools or they are gathered in groups, they can be lethal for our organism. We do not resist direct confrontations. The use of stealth and subterfuge is recommended. Use vents to move around, distract biomass with sounds, separate their individuals and assimilate them when they are alone. Take control of their tools and use them against them. The colony must be smart and know when to fight and when to run. The colony detects that Cavern was developed with elements of the Metroidvania genre, specifically in its map exploration and progression mechanics, as many of the areas are initially inaccessible. However, as the colony acquires new mutations, we will find ways to access these places, so no matter how safe you think you are or how deep you hide, sooner or later we will find a way to get to you. These mutations will not only allow the colony to assimilate new areas, but will also improve our combat and subterfuge capabilities. Some mutations will allow us to become invisible, other allow us to smash barriers that were previously indestructible. But there is a limitation. The use of the mutations is directly related to the amount of biomass that the colony carries with it at the time. For example, when the colony has assimilated the maximum amount of biomass, we can use the Keratosis mutation and create armor around our body. In comparison, the invisibility ability is only available when we have minimum biomass. This variation in abilities and biomass size will allow us to cross certain areas of the map that the human biomass designed as puzzles in order to confuse and stop the progress of the colony. It should be noted that despite the colony's superior intellect, some of these puzzles succeeded and proved quite difficult to solve. The facilities that the human biomass build are quite interesting and varied as they are spread around different areas of the planet, underground jungles, deep reefs, power reactors, etc. Each of these zones will present its own challenges that the colony must overcome, conquer and ultimately assimilate. The colony highlights the work of director and artist Sebastian Kroskowitz, as his pixel art not only brought these great cities to life, but also perfectly captured our beauty and power. However, the colony must admit that there are certain elements that we find annoying regarding Carrion's design, mainly the absence of a map. While it is understandable that the pathetic biomass tries to confuse us and make us go around in circles in its facilities, the reality is that we felt that this added an unnecessary level of frustration. In the same way, the colony considers that the artificial intelligence of the human biomass could have been a little better. Since they do not react as one would expect a stupid primate to react when they see all their friends being assimilated one by one. However, we understand that being a small independent studio, perhaps this was a task for which they did not have sufficient resources. Many critics have said that Carrion's story is bad because it does not explain where the colony came from or what our goal is. These critics will be dismembered and assimilated with maximum prejudice. The colony believes that one of the most important elements in maintaining fear and suspense in horror films is ignorance regarding the origin and purpose of the creatures featured in them. A fly does not understand the motivation or the origin of the spider that devours it, and you will not understand our motivation when we assimilate you. We wish to acknowledge the biomass bag known as Chris Velasco as we found that the rhythmic vibrations of sounds that you call soundtrack helped to create a suspenseful atmosphere in the facilities we visited, as well as being notoriously pleasant for our system of echolocalization. for his good work, this biomass pack will be the last to be assimilated. Finally, the colony wishes to let you know that Carrion is a fairly short experience and can be completed in 5 hours. 
However, we consider that this is an adequate time since it is a small independent project. The time used is enough to fully explore all the ideas and mechanics that this videographic game presents, and extending the experience beyond this point would have been unnecessary, repetitive and frustrating. The newly assimilated sack of biomass, formerly known as Meduso, really loved Carrion, because it made him feel like a monster from his favorite movies, stalking and attacking humans mercilessly, and his last thought before entering our jaws was wishing that you, the biomass watching this video, to also give this game an opportunity. Too bad it is too late for you. Look behind you! Number 7 Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout Developed by Mediatonic I hate this game And this game hates me Fall Guys is pure evil A product born of the most deranged and psychopathic minds this industry has ever seen And what makes it so horrible is that this rotten and wicked heart hides behind a mask of bright colors, upbeat music and pretty cosmetics that promise healthy fun for the whole family LIE is all a lie to cash you in its bloody clothes, a lie everyone fell for. The game was a smashing success, the popularity was so great that Mediatonic was completely caught off guard, and for several days they had problems with their servers. From its inception, Fall Guys offers a unique, vibrant and eye-catching visual style that immediately captures the attention of all those who look at it. This aesthetic look is replicated in every aspect of the game, from maps to cosmetics, and each element is colorful and cheerful. But behind these colors, there is a darkness as deep as a black hole. The cute playable gummies are actually 6 feet tall, and once you peel away the colorful surface, it reveals that under it lurks an abomination against God, and all that is good and pure in the world. The gameplay is extremely accessible with very simple and easy to understand controls, limiting the movements of the characters to a few actions like running, jumping, grabbing things and diving forward. This allows virtually anyone to take the controller and immediately understand the game without a tutorial. However, this accessibility hides an infinite potential to do evil and cause misery, because with these four simple actions, a heartless player can trigger the defeat of hundreds of innocent characters simply by grabbing them at the precise moment or pushing them when they are about to reach their goal. The composers Yukio Kalio, who we already praised a couple of years ago for his work on the Bleed 2 soundtrack, and Daniel Hagstrom have created an incredible selection of music, super upbeat and fun that immediately sticks in your brain, making itself into one of my favorite soundtracks of the year. This is of course another trick of the developers as we are so busy listening to these incredible songs that our brains do not register the cries of pain of the millions of souls that have been condemned by this game. But certainly what has made Fall Guys so successful is that it offers an innovative style of gameplay, taking the battle royale genre and doing something different with it. Instead of your typical deathmatch where players shoot each other on a map until only one survives, Fall Guys is a platformer where opponents face off on a television show in which they must go through different minigames to have a chance to win a crown at the end, which then can be exchanged for legendary cosmetics. These minigames are very original and varied. There are obstacle courses, team games, skill and memory tests, among others. And without a doubt, all these minigames are a lot of fun, until you realize that Fall Guys hates you and will do everything possible to ruin your life and the life of the people you love. Do you want to go through a door at the same time as other players? Nah, the physics of the game have decided that your character will fall to the ground and not get up until everyone has overtake you. Are you trying to pass through a seesaw platform? All your rivals will become idiots who do not understand that for one side to go up, the other has to come down first. 
Are you trying to balance yourself on a slippery floor? Inevitably, there will be an asshole waiting for you at the end to grab you and throw you into the jelly. You have a tail which you must protect until the time runs out? Well, now your rivals are able to use telekinesis and take your tail from 20 meters away, while you have to breathe right on their necks to be able to take it back. Have you somehow overcome all these problems and you are close to the last event? Very good, it's time for a team game, where you'll be put on the side where no one tries to cooperate and none of your teammates try to achieve the goal. Oh, by some miracle you made it to the finals and you think you're gonna win? <laughs> you sweet summer child, you will lose in the last second because your fucking controller did not register that you jump. Every hope, every idea, every dream I ever had, Falgoys has taken it and spit on it. Because this stupid game hates me. And it's okay, it's okay, do you know why? Because I hate it too. If the word hate was engraved in each one of the grains of sand that exists in the world, it would not be equivalent to 1000 of the hate I feel for Fall Guys. Hate. Hate. Hey, oh, wait a second. I think I'm going... I'm gonna... <gasps> I'm going to win! I'm going to win! I'm gonna win! Yes! Let's go! Let's fucking go! I am the best in the world! I am the motherfucking king of Fall Guys! This is the best game of the year! Best game of all years! Best work of art ever created by humanity! This game is timeless! It's eternal! It's incredible! I love you Fall Guys! I love you! Number 6 XCOM Chimera Squad, developed by Firaxis Games Chimera Squad is a unique case, since it could be considered more of a spin-off with a couple of new mechanics than a proper sequel to XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. This is reflected in the price of the game, costing only $20 instead of the typical $60. The story takes place 5 years after the end of XCOM 2, where we defeated the Advent Invaders. Now the new governments of Earth have a big problem, finding a way to integrate and coexist with the aliens who survived the war. Most of these survivors now inhabit City 31, which claims to be a model of peaceful coexistence between humans and aliens, however things take a turn when the mayor of the city is assassinated by unknown forces. It is up to Chimera Squad, an elite force made out of aliens and XCOM veterans, to find the culprits and prevent the city from falling into anarchy. In terms of gameplay, Chimera Squad tries to simplify the mechanics of these previous entries, making it more accessible for players new to the turn-based tactics genre. Unfortunately, the base construction and administration system was eliminated, which is quite annoying because, as I mentioned earlier, it is one of my favorite elements in this type of game. However, there are still mechanics for researching, upgrading, and buying new equipment. Your characters can also receive extra training to acquire some passive improvements and they can be sent to special investigations to obtain additional resources or information. A new tactical map has been added to the game, which shows the different districts of the city. Every few days, different missions will pop up in different areas, from which you can only select one, which will cause the district you ignore to start suffering unrest. If you fail a lot of missions or entirely ignore a district, these riots will start to spread throughout the city until you eventually lose the game. Fortunately, you can keep the peace by buying upgrades in each district or by acquiring special abilities that allow you to stop the unrest in the affected areas, plus every time you complete a story mission, tranquility will return to the city, at least for a limited time. Unlike previous XCOMs where you could create your own characters and train them in different classes, Chimera Squad only offers a selection of 11 agents, of which you can only choose 8 to form your team during the campaign, plus a couple of combat droids that serve as reinforcement during missions. All Chimera Squad characters have their own unique playstyles and abilities, and since you can only take 4 agents on each mission, it is important to experiment and see which characters work best together to understand what synergies you can create with their skills. But beyond these abilities, the characters also have their own personalities. Godmother, Bear, Password, Shelter, Thor. Ooh. Thor? No! Focus, Meduso! As I was saying, each of them has their own biography that informs how they relate to the world of XCOM. Although the dialogue is not at the level of a role-playing game, it is quite fun and perfectly reflects the attitude and vision that each of your agents has. Torque. Whisper. Are we... good? I don't know. Did you get a lobotomy? 
Can't say that I did. Then no, we aren't good. Well, at least things are back to normal. Once your agents are ready, it's time for battle. Chimera Squad has added a new bridge mode, where you choose how your units will enter the mission and what abilities they will use. Each access point grants different benefits, such as marksmanship bonuses or challenges, such as enemies who are in defensive positions. The turn-based system has also changed. While the previous entries divided the turns in such a way that you could move all your units and then the enemy move at theirs, Chimera Squad uses an initiative system, where each character and enemy has their own turn. This new system makes fighting feel more like a puzzle, where you have to carefully plan each action to try to get the most out of it. Of course, once you get used to the new turn system, Chimera Squad is still as XCOM as ever, with its typical missed shots despite standing right next to the enemy with a 90% chance of hitting. During the missions you will face three different factions, each with its own objectives, units and combat style, which requires you to vary your strategies to find the most effective way to face them. The enemy units are, for the most part, remixes of the units already seen in XCOM 2 World of the Chosen, however they have added some surprises to all of them, such as new abilities and more variety in their combat styles. Now, throughout the year this game was constantly compared to Gears Tactics, which is understandable considering they are both games on the same genre and came out pretty much the same week. If the position on this list doesn't make it obvious, let me clarify that I personally prefer Chimera Squad over Gears Tactics. This is primarily due to replayability. Since each game offers you a different selection of agents, it is possible to beat XCOM multiple times without feeling that you are replaying the same things. And this replayability is double thanks to the community mods, which add a variety of updates, new missions and even some special guests. Although the combat system in Gears seems superior to me, I found XCOM much more addictive, to the point that on multiple occasions I could not stop playing until late at night. This is probably because the missions are short, and you are constantly working on new upgrades or research, which gives you that classic just one more turn feeling. Gears is also superior in its graphics and animations, but I personally enjoy more the XCOM story, and its obvious parodies of 80s and 90s police action movies. Finally, I want to be very clear that whatever preference I have for XCOM is not related in any way to some scaly waifu. All the terrible rumors that certain bad actors have been telling about me, insinuating that my interest in Thor goes beyond her incredible abilities as an agent, are completely unfounded. At no time did I... Hey, why is that song playing? No? No? Meduso? Medusa, focus? No. No! I will not be a theme for an alien snake. It doesn't matter that she's an alpha bitch. It's a snake! Medusa, control yourself. No. Medusa, no. No. Cut the video! Cut it now! Cut it now! God damn it! Now! Number 5. Go right on through, sir. Looks like you're in the barrel today. Black Mesa, developed by Crowbar Collective. The development of Black Mesa is one of the most incredible stories seen in this industry. The project began in 2004, when Valve re-released several of its games with the new Source engine, including the classic Half-Life. However, several fans and critics were disappointed with this version of the game, because it didn't use the new graphics engine to its full capacity. And, as to be expected, two independent groups of volunteers decided to take on the task of creating a mod of Half-Life that made use of the improvements and system presented in the Source Engine. When both groups realized that they were basically working on the same project, they decided to join forces and form a team of 13 people spread around the world. This is how the Black Mesa project began. Originally, the team thought that finishing the project would not be too hard, and they planned a release date for 2009. However, as the Source Engine received improvements, Crowbar Collective decided to add new elements modifying various aspects of the original game. In 2012, a free version of Black Mesa was launched on the developer's website. The following year, Valve would approach them with an invitation to commercially launch the game on Steam with an official Source Engine license, an invitation that they obviously accepted. 
Black Mesa was released on Steam through its early access system in 2015 and included practically all the levels of the original game, with the exception of Zen, which was still in development. The team continued to grow, and over the next five years they would keep adding things like better artificial intelligence, modified levels to make the combat more interesting, and expanding the scenario. After 15 years of work, Black Mesa would receive its official launch in March 2020, no longer as a simple mod, but as a complete remake of Half-Life, a game in its own right. Black Mesa reveals everything that made Half-Life incredible, and adds a lot to bring it up to modern gaming standards. While the Source Engine already is more than a decade old, Crowbar Collective have used everything they learned over the years to make the game look very good. In general, the levels follow the same structure as the original game, but dozens of little details have been added that makes the facilities feel alive and interesting. Many of the original areas have been completely revamped so that they are somewhat more realistic and not look like typical video game levels. On the other hand, some of the longer segments such as On a Rail or Surface Tension were simplified to improve the pacing. This in general makes the experience much more fluid and fun. The NPCs have been improved with more varied models, as well as new voice lines that help in keeping the immersion, and it does a better job of tying the story with the events of Half-Life 2. The soundtrack has been recreated from scratch, and it's amazing. Joel Nielsen's excellent score managed to perfectly capture the spirit of the events that happen around you. From powerful and fast rock songs that accompany the brutal battles, to industrial ambient sounds for the slower segments. The weaponry is exactly the same as the original Half-Life, because, as the saying goes, don't fix what's not broken. The wide variety of weapons really did not leave much room to change them or add new ones, so they have simply improved the models and sounds. What has changed a lot is the artificial intelligence of the enemies. Now they are able to flank and ambush you very easily, so you have to keep moving from cover to cover, trying to find a more advantageous position. Some of the puzzles and platform sections have also been modified to make use of the Source Engine physics system, but by far the biggest change on Black Mesa is displayed on Zen. In the 90s, when Half-Life was original release, critics considered this segment to be by far the weakest, as it was a change to abrupt from the gameplay presented in the previous levels. So Crowbar Collective took the task of not only improving the playability of Zen, but also sought to expand its strongest elements, by adding new mechanics to make it more interesting. Unfortunately, I think they failed to fulfill this purpose. Zen's initial section is stunning. The developers managed to turn a lot of empty and boring islands into a beautiful alien paradise full of greenery and life. These new sections are great, not only because of their beautiful setting and music, but also because the new puzzles and challenges fit perfectly into the game and are fun to solve. The second area, Gunnar's Lair, still looks amazing, and the new fight against this boss is challenging and fun. However, this is where I started to spot some issues, as in my opinion some of the chases feel a bit longer than necessary, and a couple of puzzles at the end cut the pacing of the level. However, this is nothing compared to the next section. Interloper is the black ship of the game. This level starts out quite strong. The Vortican Village is a very detailed and interesting area on a narrative level, and the Gorgon to us pursuit is quite fun. However, once you manage to enter the enemy base, things quickly take a nosedive. I am not exaggerating when I say that this section lasts forever, as it took me almost 3 hours to complete. The level goes on and on and on and on, and it seems like it's never going to end. Every time you think you finish it, the game surprises you with more areas, which constantly are delaying your progress with repetitive puzzles and extremely complicated combat segments which require you to use the old methods of spamming F5 and F9 to keep progressing. When I finally got to the last parts, which include an amazing combat arena accompanied by the best song in the game, I was so tired and frustrated that I could not even appreciate how well done it was. 
I hate Interloper. Honestly, this level almost caused me to remove this game from the top 10. And if there's one thing I can recommend for any new player is to straight up activate the sheets and just get it over with, because this level is not worth the frustration it causes. And I hope that one day some modder makes a shorter version of it. Fortunately, the game picks up in an incredible way, with the final fight against the Nihilan, which is so good that it made me forget the frustration and anger that Interloper caused me. At the end of the day, the fun I had playing Black Mesa far outweighs all the negative aspects, as it managed to transport me back to 1998, when I was a little kid playing Half-Life on my first computer. From a small group of volunteers trying to create a mod to an award-winning game on Steam, the incredible story of Black Mesa and Crowbar Collective can only be called a resounding success, and it deserves its place in this top 10. Number 4 Ori and the Will of the Wisp, developed by Moon Studios It may come as a surprise to many, but I honestly didn't like Ori and the Blind Forest, despite being an extremely well-received award-winning product outside of its beautiful art style and music, it didn't grab my attention. I found its combat system quite frustrating and the progression felt too linear for a metroidvania style game. So my expectations were pretty low when I started playing the sequel. It only took an hour to realize that Ori and the Will of the Wisp is a very different piece from its predecessor. Not only it is bigger and more varied, but it also adds a lot of gameplay mechanics that makes it incredibly fun. The story continues directly after the end of The Blind Forest, however it is not necessary to play the first game to understand it, as the narration explains all of the most relevant things about the characters. Suffice to say that our protagonist Ori and his friend Ku are lost on a distant island, where the light of the spirits died a long time ago, and they must find a way to return to their home, while trying to do everything possible to repair the damage that the corruption has caused to these lands. The game has a greater focus on exploration, which is reflected in the map, as it's three times larger than the one in its prequel, and has a great variety of beautiful areas full of details and challenges. Will of the Wisp is much less linear than its predecessor, and allows the player to explore the map more freely for resources and upgrades. These upgrades give Ori new skills, like the ability to breathe underwater, drill through the air, propel yourself in the air using enemies, etc., which in turn will allow access to previously unreachable areas. The progression that the protagonist has throughout the game is wonderful. It starts out with very limited movement, however by the time you reach endgame, Ori is able to move with impressive agility and freedom. Your movement abilities will be put to the test in a small races scattered throughout the map, which require you to use all of your skills to reach the goal as quickly as possible and beat the record of other players. The sequel has also implemented several NPCs, which we can find in a village in the center of the map. These characters can serve as merchants, from which we will obtain new items and abilities, or as quest givers. These quests are pretty straightforward, and range from eliminating certain enemies to finding and trading specific items. As a reward for completing these missions, Ori can improve his health and energy or receive building materials, which can be used to repair the village, making it more beautiful and friendly to its inhabitants. And even though the director gets mad every time someone makes this comparison, it's inevitable not to mention that Will of the Wisp has some mechanics that remind me quite a bit of Hollow Knight. For example, to be able to access the map of a new area, it is necessary to buy it from an NPC called Lupo, who travels throughout the world to map it, in a very similar way to Cornifer from Hollow Knight. The regeneration skills are fairly similar, as in both games you need to spend your mana in order to gain health back. Finally, Will of the Wisps added a Spirit Charge system, which grants small passive improvements to Ori's abilities, or modify how they work. The charts can be exchanged at any point, but are limited by the amount of slots available on the character. This mechanic is very similar to the charms used in Hollow Knight, which also modified and improved the character's abilities and are limited by the number of notches you have. However, the game director made it quite clear that he did not copy anything from Team Cherry's masterpiece, and that he resented these comparisons. So, any similarity between these two platform adventure games of the Metroidvania genre with a 2D perspective is mere coincidence. 
but without a doubt, my favorite improvement on Wheel of the Wiz is the new combat system. Whereas in the previous game Ori was unable to directly attack enemies, he is now able to go toe to toe against them in close combat, which is fun and challenging. Throughout the adventure, Ori can acquire a variety of weapons and offensive skills, ranging from swords and hammers, with which you can make Devil May Cry style combos, to powerful magics capable of causing massive damage from a distance. This new approach is reflected in the combat shrines, during which you will have to defeat waves of enemies to acquire new upgrades. These confrontations never cease to be interesting, as Wheel of the Wiz has greatly expanded its repertoire of enemies, making them more aggressive and challenging for the player. And obviously, the bosses should be highlighted. All of them have incredible designs and perfect musical themes to accompany the battle. Unfortunately, the game only offers 6 of them, however each one requires the use of different strategies, forcing you to take advantage of your new abilities to obtain victory. In conclusion, Ori and the Will of the Wisp is a perfect sequel, that maintains the best aspects of the first game while improving on everything else. It managed to tie these mechanics to an incredibly beautiful story, which has some of the most dramatic and special moments that this artistic medium has given me throughout the year. Number 3 Star Wars Squadrons Developed by Motip Studios Almost 20 years have passed since the release of the last Star Wars game focused on space combat. But finally, the force has answered our prayers with Star Wars Squadrons, a space battle game with incredible gameplay. Surprisingly, the mechanics in Squadrons are closer to the space sim genre like the X-Queen franchise than to action shooters like Rogue Squadron. The game forces you into a first-person perspective, keeping you inside the cockpit, which offers you all the necessary information regarding what is happening around you, such as your current objectives, the position of your enemies and power distribution in your three main systems, shields, weapons and engines. You can maintain the power balance between them or divert all power to a specific system. This will allow you to overload shields to resist more damage, increase the rate of fire on your weapons or generate extra speed boosts to escape dangerous situations. A squadron suffers two factions, the New Republic and the Imperial Remnants, but with four different types of ships with specific functions. Fighters, a well-balanced ship capable of holding their own in different circumstances. Interceptors, which specialize in shooting down enemy fighters. Bombers, designed to take a lot of punishment and destroy capital ships. And the support ships, whose mission is to provide help to the rest of the squad, repairing their ships, giving them extra shields, reloading their ammunition, etc. Two new free ships were added in a later update. The Big Win for the Republic, a bomber with a gyroscopic cockpit, and the TIE Defender for the Empire, which is an experimental interceptor. Every ship has a large number of modifications available, primary and secondary weapons, defensive systems, armor, shields, engines. Each of these has an impact on the way your ship functions, allowing you to specialize or modify its combat style. You can also customize the ships with different cosmetics, from bright and vibrant colors to little baby Yoda figures to decorate your cockpit. And the best part is that these cosmetics do not come in loot boxes, you simply acquire them with the points that the game gives you when you complete different missions. Squadrons offers a single player story mode. The plot takes place a few months after the Battle of Endor, and revolves around the Starhawk project, a prototype capital ship that the New Republic is building from the remains of the Imperial Star Destroyers. The campaign alternates between two different perspectives. First you play as Vanguard 5, a pilot from the New Republic assigned to Vanguard Squadron, and whose missions are focused on helping complete the Starhawk project and protecting it from the Imperials. The other perspective is that of the Empire, where we play as Titan 3, a member of the Titan Combat Squadron. As expected, this mission focuses on trying to locate and destroy the Starhawk project before its completion. The campaign has several nods to the new Star Wars canon, and there are even cameos of some characters from the novels and TV series, such as Admiral Sloan, General Sindula, and of course, the Grand, the only, the incredible commander of Rock Squadron, Wesh, motherfucking Antilles! Ooh, what? Oh, come on! Not again! Stop the music! 
You can find a great variety of missions, ambushes in space junkyards, escorting allied vehicles through nebulas, assaults on enemy facilities, etc. The levels are beautiful and show off the capabilities of the Frostbite engine, which runs flawlessly, even during graphically demanding scenes. And if you want to put your pilot skills to the test, the campaign has optional challenges, ranging from passing the mission under a time limit to shooting down enemy missiles before they damage your allies. Unfortunately, the care in the design of the missions is not reflected in the supporting cast, who are quite simplistic in their personalities and dialogues, especially on the side of the Republic. It's not that the characters are bad, they all have their own stories and ideologies, but I didn't find them interesting since they do not show any development throughout the game. The Imperial characters suffer from the same problem, but at least it's more entertaining to be one of the bad guys, and it's nice to finally have a game with evil protagonists who don't defect by the middle of the story. My other criticism is that the marketing and campaign structure points towards an epic battle between Vanguard and Titan squadrons at the end of the game, however this fight never occurs. The ending left me quite unsatisfied, because it feels like everything that happened throughout the campaign didn't have any weight or relevance, as it returned everything to the status quo. But of course, this is simply the result of the extreme control that Disney has over the new Star Wars canon, which in my opinion greatly limits the freedom of its writer to try new and interesting ideas. In general, the campaign left me wanting more. More missions, more scenarios, more ships, more interesting dialogues and characters, more Wesh, motherfucking Antilles. But no, it seems that the studio has no plans to launch extra missions or anything like that, which is quite disappointing. Outside of the campaign, Squadrons offers three multiplayer modes. The first one is a skirmish, where two squadrons of five players try to shoot down 30 enemy ships first. The second is Rank Fleet Battle, which is the competitive mode of the game, where the objective is to destroy the enemy capital ship. The third mode is Cooperative Fleet Battles, where your human allies fight against the AI. I have a lot of things to say about the multiplayer, and few of them are good. My first big annoyance was that it launched with a multitude of problems, both in its functions and in its servers. During the first three weeks there was a bug that had me stuck at rank 0 in competitive mode, no matter how many games I won or lost, until the developer finally added an option to reset your ranking. The servers were super unstable, and on multiple occasions the game kicked me in the middle of a match without giving me the option to reconnect. This happened so many times that I ended up receiving a liver's penalty, even though I never quit any of those games. And when I wasn't the one being kicked, sooner or later one of my allies or enemies would end up suffering this, causing uneven fight before matches. And if by some miracle you didn't suffer any of these problems, chances are that you will end up fighting against players so skilled that it seems they were trained by Poe Dameron himself. These issues, coupled with the lack of more casual modes and the steep difficulty curb, led many people to quickly lose interest in squadrons. Today Steam only records an average of 500 daily players, so it takes several minutes before finding a match. It certainly sounds like this game disappoints me. And to a certain extent, this is true. I really feel that there are many aspects that could have been expanded and improved. But then, how is it possible for squadrons to rank so high on this list? Well, that's because playing it in virtual reality is one of the most incredible experiences I ever had in my life. When I was a kid, I pretended to be a rebel pilot who helped Luke destroy the Death Star. I could spend hours imagining my conversations with the other pilots, while using little paper airplanes to simulate my incredible maneuvers. I know it sounds cliché, but playing a squadrons in VR took me back to those years. I have no words to describe the illusion it caused me to see the inside of the cockpit of an X-Wing, or how dumbfounded I was to fly next to a Mon Calamari cruiser, or how fast my heart beat when I charged at full speed against a Star Destroyer. This feeling is so powerful that despite all its problems, Squadrons was very close to being my favorite game of the year, and it would have been if it weren't for the absolute brutal competition it had. Even so, I think this third position is more than deserved, and I hope that its developers can continue working on it to expand the experience. Number 2 no. Oh my god. Dad. No. Don't leave me. Dad. 
13 years. 13 years since the release of Half-Life 2, Episode 2. 13 years since that legendary and infamous end to the saga. 13 years of rumors and disappointments. 13 fucking years. When the lead writer of the series, Mark Laidlaw, left Valve in 2016, I completely lost hope that this franchise would ever make a return. Clearly Valve was more than happy winning millions of dollars with Steam and their Dota tournaments, and I had no choice but to resign myself to the fact that there would never be a Half-Life 3. And then, this happened. Half-Life Alex, developed by Valve. Before getting into the analysis of my experience with the game, I must talk about the controversy surrounding the announcement. Many people were very upset with the fact that the game was released exclusively on VR. This is completely understandable, since virtual reality is quite expensive, not only because of the price of the equipment, but also because building a computer capable of running these games requires a considerable investment. As I have mentioned in other videos, my PC could be considered high range and it barely could run Alex on the lowest settings. If you want to play it with its recommended specifications and a good quality headset, you will have to fork out at least $2000. But I totally disagree with the reviews that say that the use of the virtual reality is just a gimmick that does not complement the gameplay. These critics do not understand that each release of Half-Life has been used by Valve to test new technologies, and Alex was 100% built to be played this way, and demonstrated by making use of all the strengths that this new medium brings with it. From the first scene it is clear that this level of detail and immersion is only possible with VR. In practice, Alex is not very original, however what Valve has created is an extremely polished and refined version of the ideas previously explored by other titles. It is also extremely accessible, offering a ton of options to personalize your experience and make it more comfortable. You can play standing or sitting, change the movement style to continuous or teleportation, make continuous or snapping turns, and you have multiple difficulty settings. In this sense, Alex is the perfect introduction for people using VR for the first time. The story plays you 5 years before the start of Half-Life 2, with the Combine at the peak of its power after conquering Earth in just 7 hours. Our protagonist, the titular Alex, is on a recon mission in City 17 as part of the Resistance. However, a series of unfortunate events forced her to go to the Quarantine Zone, an area forbidden after it was completely infested by wild alien lifeforms. You quickly discover there are bigger things happening behind the Quarantine Walls. Deep within it, the Combine has built a vault to protect what could be the answer to the Resistance problems. Unlike Gordon Freeman, Alex is not a silent protagonist, so she is constantly having conversations with the NPCs or making comments regarding what is going on around her. The work that the writers did is remarkable, the story is entertaining and the dialogue is very funny. Is this supposed to come off? It's the opposite of what it's supposed to do, Alex. What, what, do, I, what do I do now? Uh, well, don't panic. We'll, we'll stop panicking if you are. I'm not panicking. The scenarios blew me away, even in low graphics they all look great and are packed with elements that help develop the story grow environmental storytelling. From the European abandoned streets of City 17 to underground caves teeming with alien life. In each level you will find a multitude of details and interactive objects that will make you feel as if you are really there. 
The soundtrack, composed by Mike Moraski, is mainly made up of ambient sounds that help the immersion of the player. However, in certain specific moments, the music will kick into full gear to emphasize the sensation of thrill, terror, weirdness, or violence. And let me tell you, when the music hits, it hits hard. Finally, we have to talk about the gameplay. The first level allows us to slowly adapt to the controls and mechanics of virtual reality, until finally we get the Rossers, a pair of gravity globes that can attract objects towards you with just a hand movement. The Rossers are our main tool throughout the game, allowing us to reach, catch, and interact with the objects around us. From here on, Alex can be divided into three main gameplay elements. First, we have the exploration. The levels are full of useful items for the players, such as ammunition for your weapon, health packs to heal yourself, or resin to improve your equipment. However, everything is scattered throughout the levels, and to find them you will sometimes have to literally search through the trash. The second element is the puzzles. Using her multi-tool, Alex can hack into the combined machines to break into new areas or access items. As you will expect, all these puzzles make use of the unique perspective of virtual reality, and they range from reconnecting wiring through walls, deactivating mines, or focusing lasers in a certain direction. Although, in my opinion, this is the weakest part of the game. While the puzzles are original and interesting the first time you find them, by the middle of the campaign they become extremely repetitive, and even frustrating due to the difficulty of some of them. Personally, I think they just needed a bit more variety. Finally, as expected, the last element of gameplay is combat. And oh my god, no other game could match the sensation that combat in VR can offer. Having to dock and move in order to take over, catching grenades midair and throwing them back, and running out of ammo at the most inopportune moment and fumbling with your weapon to reload is incredible! The game offers us two different classes of enemies. On one hand, we have the alien wildlife that has infested Earth. Here we find several trademarks of the franchise, such as the head crabs and lions and barnacles, which I must admit look absolutely terrifying in VR. With them also come some new variations, like armored head crabs and the electric dogs. These enemies are by themselves not the most dangerous, however, in large groups and in enclosed spaces, they can be a little threat. The second type of enemy is the Combined Soldiers, forces that specialize in keeping the population under control. Fighting against them is my favorite part of the game, because its artificial intelligence makes use of all sorts of tactics to stop you. They can throw grenades to force you out of cover, or use suppressive fire to keep you stuck while their allies flank you, heavy troops can advance towards you, basically tanking all your attacks, while engineers drop combat drones to chase you, no matter where you hide. Each fight against them is incredible and very challenging, even in low difficulties, so you must make smart use of your weapons and resources. The weaponry consists of a pistol, a shotgun, and an SMG plus two different types of grenades. At first glance, these options seem to be very limited, and it is true that personally I would have liked more variety, such as a sniper rifle or melee weapons. However, our equipment can be improved and modified using the resin that we find. These upgrades make weapons more versatile. You can add a grenade launcher to your shotgun, add a sight to your SMG, or increase the fire rate of your pistol, among other things. All these elements combine to create a unique experience that would not have been possible to portray in any other medium. And there is no bigger example of this than the 7 level, Jeff. If you forgive some spoilers, this level consists of going through an abandoned distillery. The only problem is that an indestructible monster named Jeff lives there. The good news is that Jeff is blind. The bad news is that Jeff has an exceptional ear. The worst news is that Jeff is constantly dispersing spores, which will cause you to sneeze if you get too close, and the entire level is filled with fragile glass bottles. 
If you don't want to attract his attention, you need to find a respirator or cover your mouth with a hand to avoid breathing the spores. After going through several levels ignoring the bottles or playing with them, they suddenly turn into dangerous traps, which you have to move carefully to avoid shattering them. I don't usually talk about it, but the direction is impressive, because this level plays with your expectations at all times, it forces you to make decisions that you don't want to make, and it leads you into terrifying situations. And this is nothing compared to the last level. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about it because there will be many spoilers, but suffice to say this level has revived my love for Half-Life all by itself. But it does not end here, because Valve released development tools, which enable the fans to create their own mods. New levels, new weapons, more enemies, more options, and even tributes to other games. The variety of these mods is impressive, and this is just the beginning. Half-Life Alyx is the triumphant return of one of the most iconic and influential franchises in the video game industry, and it leaves the doors open for this incredible story to continue. I just hope I don't have to wait another decade to see the next installment. Hey Russ, name a song. Flight of the Bumblebee. Coming right up. That's it! Number 1 Well, this is awkward. <laughs> Paul Sagrius. Not one step further. Come on, Meg. Haven't we had more than enough of each other by now? Besides, don't you have some place else to be? Your father sent me. All in all, I'd rather be on your bad side than his. Now you can turn back like a good little man, or I can send you home the painful way. What'll it be? I'll have to go with the painful way. A man after my own heart. Hades, developed by Supergiant Games. Hades is a fucking masterpiece. Theme, story, characters, dialogue, voice acting, art direction, setting, level design, music, audio direction, mechanics, progression, gameplay, and entertainment. Each of these elements by itself is already incredible, with a level of quality and care that only a small independent studio could show. However, Supergiant Games took things to the next level, achieving something that very few games managed to do, to integrate each of these elements so that they complement each other, elevating Hades to a level that can only be called art. And I almost miss it! When Hades was released, I was surprised by the amount of people commenting on how good it was, but when I saw the trailer promoting it as a godlike roguelike, I immediately lost all interest. I personally don't like roguelikes. With the exception of Dead Cells, I find these type of games extremely frustrating, as having to start over from the beginning every time you die and not being able to progress continuously is annoying for me. So I plan on skipping Hades in favor of focusing on other games. It wasn't until December, when I saw several of my favorite critics calling it their game of the year, that I became interested in it again. With nothing to lose, I decided to give it a try to see if it really was as good as everyone said. The game only needed 20 minutes to have me completely in its clutches. 
what makes it different from other games of the same genre is that at all times you feel like you are making progress. While it is common for modern roguelikes to have a passive progression system where you acquire new things after each run, Hades takes it one step further, connecting the story and introducing new gameplay elements with each attempt you'd make. This way, the frustration of failing a run is mitigated, because you can still see and experience new things. The story has a fairly simple premise. Our protagonist is Agrius, the son of Hades, who is trying to escape from the underworld. However, this is not due to simple teenage rebellion. There is a very important reason why he wants to reach the surface, and as we progress into the game, a wonderful story is revealed. To achieve his goal, Sagrius has six different weapons, each one with its own different combat styles and special abilities. For example, the Stygian Sword is a well-balanced blade, it's not very fast, but it does deal acceptable damage, and it has an ability that lets you damage enemies around you. Meanwhile, the Aegis Shield lets you block attacks, but you can also feel like Captain America and throw it at multiple enemies. On top of this, as we progress through the story, we can unlock new aspects for the weapons that do not only grant new bonuses, but also modify the special abilities and overall combat balance. And if that was not enough, while exploring the levels you can also find Daedalus Hammers, which offer upgrades for your weapons. They range from a simple increase in attack speed to complete mechanical changes on how they work. Sagrius is not alone in his attempts to escape. His relatives on Olympus are ready to help him by offering boons that grant him new abilities. These boons are randomly given and modify different characters' mechanics, such as his basic attack or his dash. The effect of these abilities depends on the god who gives them to you. Zeus obviously allows you to cast lightning. Athena, for her part, gives you shield that bonds bad attacks. Aphrodite allows you to weaken enemies, Dionysus gives them a handover, Demeter can freeze them, etc. However, among all the boons, the most important is the Call. As Sagris fights or takes damage, a special energy bar is filled, and when the bar is full, you can call for help from the god who offered you that gift, which will let you unleash an extremely powerful ability. Each boon has different rarity ranks, which determine how powerful their effect is, by using certain items that you find throughout the game, you can raise their level and rank to improve their effects. Basically, when you combine the great diversity of boons and weapons at your disposal, Hades offers dozens of possibilities regarding the way you approach combat. Thanks to this enormous variety, you can easily accommodate and vary your player style to whatever you choose. To escape from the underworld, Sagres will have to pass through four different but beautiful areas. Tartarus, Dasphodel Meadows, Elysium, and the Temple of Styx. Each of these areas is divided into small rooms, which were handcrafted to offer greater gameplay variety and balance. Their order changes every time you start a run, which helps prevent the scenarios from becoming repetitive. Once you defeat all the enemies in a room, you receive a reward in the form of resources such as gold, gems, and keys, or health improvements and boons. While traveling through the rooms, sometimes you will come across Charon, the legendary ferryman from the underworld. Charon seems to get bored with rowing all day, and has decided to set up a little shop, where he offers a selection of very useful items in exchange for your money. And with some luck, you will also come across some other characters, such as Eurydice, Patroclus, or Sisyphus, who will help you by offering free items and upgrades. Unfortunately for Sagrius, escaping will prove to be quite complicated. The underworld is full of extremely dangerous enemies, and each area has its own variation of them, offering different types of challenges. The enemies on Tartarus are generally slow and perfect for beginners, while on Elysium you will meet legendary champions that are fast and extremely deadly. At the end of each area you will have to fight against a boss. Each one of them has a different combat pattern which you must learn in order to win. However, in a similar way to the enemies, the bosses will begin to add variations in their attacks, or directly add new skills each run, which keeps the fights fresh and interesting, despite being repeated multiple times. But no matter how well you do, this is a roguelike, so sooner or later you will die. The good news is that Sagrius, being a Ketonic god, simply comes back to life back in his father's palace, which serves as a central hub from which we can upgrade our skills, advance the story, practice with our weapons, but above all, it gives us the opportunity to pet Cerberus! Game of the year! 
every time you die, you lose the boons that the gods offer you, along with the health improvements you obtain, but you do keep some of the resources, which can be used to obtain permanent upgrades. Keys can be used to unlock new weapons and abilities, the darkness will help you improve your skills permanently, the gems will allow you to buy upgrades for the palace, such as a restaurant bar or decorations for your room, such as a heart that we don't know how to play. Uh. Also in the palace we will find a skelly, a skeleton hair to help us practice our combat and in which we can test our weapons and skills. But my favorite part of returning to the palace apart from petting Cerberus, is that it gives me the opportunity to talk with the incredible characters that live there. The first thing I should highlight is the amazing voice acting. This area is especially astonishing, because while other games have a huge amount of resources, such as motion capture or facial scanning to facilitate the performance and development of their characters, Hades only has a static to the art, so the personification of the NPCs falls almost entirely on the voice acting, forcing the actors to keep their all. I want to highlight the work of Darren Corp in his role as Sagrius, because he is not a full-time voice actor, and in fact his main job description is as composer and audio designer, so the work that he did in this game is admirable, nailing the cocky but naive himbo attitude of the character. Care on, mate. Now, hypothetically, if I provided you with, say, a thousand coins, would you be willing to give me a ride in your beautiful boat? Upriver, I should say, specifically. I had to ask. Of course, voice acting will not be enough without the work the writers put into creating interesting lines, and Hades has them at fistfuls. According to the Noclip documentary, Developing Hell, the game has more than 20,000 lines of dialogue, and thanks to a system developed by Supergiant Games, these are activated according to the player progress, in such a way that the NPCs will react in a credible way to your actions, failures and achievements. Each Hades NPC has a complex background and personality, with their own fears, regrets and dreams, which we can learn about throughout the game. Sagrius has an affinity level with each one of the NPCs, and to increase it we can give them gifts such as nectar or ambrosia, which can be obtained as a reward in each run. Increasing this level of affinity will give us access to new dialogues, and we can help the characters to fulfill their personal dreams. Even if you have no interest in the quest of the side characters, it is advisable to give them at least one nectar, because in exchange for it they will give you a keepsake which offers you a small bonus, such as receiving less damage or having more life. These bonuses can be improved if you continue to use the same keepsake on multiple runs, and if you maximize your affinity, some NPCs will offer you a companion, which you can use to summon their help during battles. But honestly, the first thing that anyone will notice in the NPCs are their wonderful designs. They are extremely detailed and reflect their personality throughout the clothes and ornaments they wear. And of course, the fact that they are so stupidly, ridiculously, astonishingly sexy! Oh. My. God. You know what? Fuck it! Play the music! Unfortunately, you can only romance a couple of the characters. For the rest, you will have to settle with platonic relationships. Since we are talking about it, the level of maturity with which romantic relationships are handled is also admirable. While in other games these relationships feel like rewards you get after saying and doing the right things, in Hades they progress credibly and naturally, with the characters sharing their experience, admitting their mistakes and helping each other with their problems. This year was also saturated with incredible music. Doom Eternal, Black Mesa, Fall Guys, Alex, Ori, Carrion, each one remarkable in their own style. But, out of all of them, Hades music is by far my favorite of the year. Just listen to it.
the quality of these songs is just enviable. Each one fits perfectly with the setting and the characters they represent, and are so catchy that several of them have made it into my cell phone permanent playlist. There are many other aspects and mechanics in the game. Chaos Boons, Bacchus Punishment, Prophecies, and even Fishing, but I need to wrap this video up since it is already way too long. The last point I want to talk about is Hades' development. Thanks to the Noclip documentary, and the fact that this game was originally released in early access, the development process was extremely transparent, allowing the players to closely follow the methods and ways this studio works. And I'm happy to say that Supergiant Games is an example of how this industry should function. During the production of these games there were no cases of crunch or any type of mistreatment or abuse towards workers. The work environment was extremely healthy and even when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, they maintained a culture that allowed the team to remain safe. The results of working under these conditions are immediately apparent. Hades is the fourth highest rated game for Switch on Metacritic, and has the second highest positive ratings on Steam. But about all, it's number one in Medusa's top 10 of 2020. I dedicate this victory to you, Good Shade. Oof! Congratulations! We made it to the end of the video. And to think that when I started writing this script, I told myself that I was going to make it shorter than last year. And now you see, I ended up making the longest video on this channel. But hey, if it has been entertaining, then it has been worth it. I honestly don't know what the future of the channel is. Obviously I have a lot of plans and projects, like continuing the D&D campaign, making more editorial videos, and starting to expand the content in English. However, only God knows how viable that will be, considering that I will be moving very soon, and I do not know what the future holds for me. If for some reason this is my last video for a long time, I want to tell you that I really appreciate the support that you have given me. Thank you very much for allowing me to steal some of your time to share with you my opinions and ideas. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to entertain you. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like and share your thoughts in the comments. Before leaving, I also need to thank my good friend Catherine for proofreading the English version of this script and helping me translate it. And you know the rest, you can follow me on Twitter, subscribe to the channel, and click on the bell, etc, etc. I am Temeduso, thank you very much for watching, and until next time.